So great to hear from the governor. And what a great surprise to hear from, uh, from uh, John Sharp. I uh, want to introduce our next panelist, uh, my friend uh, Bob uh, Frickland. Bob is the chief upstream strategist with um, IHS Market. Uh, he told me to keep this short, so I will. 40 years, an industry guy, uh, Conoco Phillips, IHS guy. Uh, um, a lot of brain power comes with uh, Bob Frickland, and I just wanted you to have the benefit of that as I have many times. Uh, Bob chairs the um, IPAA uh, Supply and Demand Committee, which I've been on for uh, many years. So I've known him for a long time and gotten to see uh, and listen to uh, his thoughts and presentations a number of times. So. Bob, welcome. Thank you for joining us, and I appreciate you being a part of this conference today. Hi, Carr. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, see you, so to speak, uh, as well during these times. And I want to thank uh, both Jason, Cy, and the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers uh, for a chance to uh, participate today. And what I want to do is, it's, we're going to have a couple of formal remarks to begin with, but hopefully paint a, a path of maybe uh, a little more optimism, uh, something we don't hear a lot these days, uh, but one of uh, sort of a, a vision of where this recovery is starting to move. Um, we're gonna have to start with a couple of basic, shall we say facts, if we would, uh, around where we are, but really kind of cover five things. The first, a little bit about the macro, uh, a little bit then second around the US, and then start uh, thinking about what are the companies doing as we go forward and finish up really then uh, about what are the choices that the companies have to make going forward uh, as they start to recover. And then the, the last uh, topic we'll kind of get into before we kind of have a round robin, I think ours is a little bit around natural gas and really the, the optimism that's there right now uh, and, and growing, shall we say. So I have a few slides just to kind of take us um, through the discussion a little bit and maybe Tina, if you could uh, put the first one up for me. So here's um, this, when you kind of start to think of things, a lot's been going on as far as uh, economics. Have you heard uh, the previous speaker, Mr. Roberts, talk about uh, W's, V's, and et cetera, the alphabets as we call it in economics. Uh, what we like to kind of think about here is looking at just the basic supply and demand, and that is actually taking uh, a little more of a standard kind of up and down look to it. Um, it has flattened out some. Um, there's no doubt now that we, we did drop to bottom, uh, and we are on our way out. The bottom um, surprised a lot of folks. It came quicker uh, and deeper at roughly 10 million barrels a day. And this graph shows you that blue line on here is the supply and the gold line is, is the demand. Um, as we start to recover um, here in the next couple of months, we're starting to put those shut-in barrels back on. Roughly 2 million barrels a day of U.S. production was shut in to help us get to that 10 million barrels a day uh, number. Uh, that's starting to come back on. By September, we should have uh, two-thirds of that back up and running. So the companies are prioritizing um, the barrels that they're putting back on. A lot of them are ducks, but some um, are the shut-ins. So that's the first sort of step in recovery uh, that's happening now is, is production coming back. Um, however, when we look at that, if we come to the next slide, the one thing that we have to kind of solve going forward is a sort of a stall out in our mobility. Um, the slide here shows you two different ways to think about the global gasoline demand around the world. Uh, when you look at the orange line on the left, that's U.S. gasoline demand. You can see it, it did pretty much what uh, oil supply and demand fundamentals would tell you. As people start moving, um, the demand goes up. However, um, many of us aren't going back to the office. We're not back in our office. Uh, many people have moved to the country, uh, whether it's Colorado or the beach, uh, just to get out of the big cities. And their driving habits are a lot different. So going forward, um, we're hopeful that as kind of the virus, um, shall we say, um, we get better with handling it, uh, with the 
way to, to treat it, uh, perhaps even with the vaccines next year, that more people go back to the office and we'll get that additional 20% that we're down on a global basis right now on gasoline demand. That's what's stalling the recovery a little bit. Um, you, can, you can see that whether it, the right-hand side is, um, is, is really the workplace, the left-hand side on here is recreation. So it doesn't matter really where, where you are or what you're doing. It's, it's that stall that's kind of got us capped at the moment on the recovery. Um, so I guess if there's one good news here is uh, get in your car and drive somewhere, right? Um, the, the next one, if we move to the next slide and kind of start to think about um, what is, what's going on with the companies at Tina, thank you, and start to think about the United States itself. So here's this big system and probably few places in the world could duplicate and that's a lot why many of the operators came back to the United States is the flexibility of the US system. And so you can see on this waterfall chart, you're looking at the left starting in December 2019, um, what the overall production was in the US. So we were at 12.8. Um, you can see where we think we're gonna end at about 10.1. But we will start then to gradually come back up. Um, each of these plays, um, the green bars denote growth, the red bars denote uh, kind of a loss, and that's what we've seen, right? We've seen contraction, um, not destruction. So that's a very critical word definition here. Uh, there will be some destruction of US production. Uh, our estimates are around 500,000 barrels a day of US production that will not come back on. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that will be the smaller producers, uh, the ones that we were just talking about, those that are struggling to make payrolls that are borrowing money from the PPP program, um, but they may have trouble um, coming out of this because of the kind of the length of this. But you can see um, a, that recovery will start uh, next year, particularly for the largest basin that we have, the Permian, uh, which will drive sort of that recovery, and, but a very modest growth. Um, this is a very different story than what we've had um, since 2009 when the United States grew at sometimes at more than 30% per year when you look at the plays on an individual basis, just phenomenal growth, not repeated anywhere in the world um, in the history of the oil and gas business to date. I mean, we had two solid years of over 1.5 million barrels a day of new growth in production uh, on a base of over 10 million. So it was just unprecedented. Uh, we won't see that again, uh, but we will see uh, a steady growth in many of the places this kind of shows. And this is a lot of what gonna happen um, as we start to go forward and think about the behavior of the individual companies. Uh, this is a lot to do with uh, the new fundamentals that companies are looking at uh, as far as metrics. And really, when we think about it, it's what I like to call the contract with shareholders. Uh, we some ways kind of gotten away with that. Um, for a while, um, we used to kind of get away with it because the commodity prices were going up uh, at the same time as our growth was. Uh, so therefore, our shareholder returns um, were pretty good. But for the last a decade almost, that's been a struggle for many to get back into the double digits. And unfortunately, the um, contraction here kind of delayed, if you would, um, a bit of the, the change that was undergoing already, the renaissance uh, for the companies to, to put uh, shareholders uh, on top once more um, in a very elevated way uh, to where they were. And if we could have the next slide, please. We, we'll start to talk about that, this first then in the, in the kind of the decline that we have to deal with. So everyone has a, a minimum amount of cash that they have in their, in their purses. And when you kind of think about that, you have a number of options to use that cash for. Well, this graph that looks 
somewhat like a, a fan graph or a little bit of a complicated one, shows you the decline on a year-over-year -year basis of the United States overall system. So those numbers on the bottom, if you would, show from the zero line across that that's the base decline of, of those plays. Each color there is a play in the US. And you can see that as we've marched from 2016 till today, we've more than doubled the amount of base decline that we have to take care of just to stay flat. And so what's happening is that that capital that people have been so well guarding, but in the past have been used for growth is now going dominantly. And in fact, this year, 85% of it will go to just staying flat. And when you look at that curve then on the above the line, that shows you the growth that's there um, on a year over year basis. And the faster that growth, the more the decline on the bottom, if you, if you read me. The net, if you would, between those two numbers is the net total for that year. So when you look at it, look what's happening now when we start to think about this year and next year. So we hit this year a tremendous, almost 4.7 million barrels a day that we have to replace next year. Massive. But look at it when you think about it. It's slowed down though, because the wells we're drilling are, there are fewer wells that we're drilling this year and they're not as big as they were. So this is setting up as we go out towards 23, growth again. And you can start to see that when you net that out, but it's not a lot of growth compared to those other years. So we're talking about from 21 forward, a growth in the US system of roughly around 300 to 400,000 barrels a day. A lot of that then is going to be used, the money that comes from that will be used not so much um, to continue to grow the system, but more so to go to the shareholders. And that's the critical thing. So that's the, what we call maintenance capital versus growth capital. And the next slide, I think maybe you'll get a, a better understanding of this. So this shows you that kind of net effect when you look at it from left to right. So the 2014, the very far left-hand portion of the slide, this is a free cash flow in the dotted black line and then the growth in either green or the drop in production in red. And what you can see is the very end on the far left of the first growth spurt in North America. Then of course, we had the crisis. Then we had another massive growth, 17 through 19. The big red bar that you see for today is what's happened. And then you can see we return to growth. But more importantly, look at that black line. So that's where we kind of went awry, if you would, with a negative um, free cash flow. Going forward, we're gonna see cash flow return um, at the same time. So the balancing act is what is starting to happen for all the operators is how much cash do I put back in the business versus return to shareholders. Most shareholders, of course, are always gonna want more. Um, kind of rules of thumb, somewhere between 65 and 75% of the free cash flow should be going back into reinvesting in that business. The remainder should be split between the shareholders and servicing debt. That's, that's the kind of main equation that we're looking at now. It also drives us to a new set of, of metrics. So it's not NAV per barrel that's important. It's free cash flow per barrel that's important now. Um, you've got to have a, a debt to EBITDA ratio of less than two. Um, you can go through and see this with a lot of the operators. Those that are in trouble, um, it's pretty clear, particularly uh, when you look at the reserve predeterminations uh, and the debts that, that's happening. So this is gonna drive the future um, very much. It's a positive message in that we will get back to cash flow. It was delayed by the um, coronavirus and the demand drop here, but the, 
the system is actually getting to a better place than we've been if you look at this graph, even when we had the tremendous growth in 17 through 19 uh, that we haven't been since really about 2012. So it's a, it's a very phenomenal shift, if you would. Um, the, the kind of the last uh, formal slide that I want to kind of put forward there out for you, Carr, and really is to think about gas. So interestingly enough, um, when you look at gas in a waterfall system very similar to what we looked at for oil, looking at the left-hand side, um, again, the same thing. You, where it's negative, you see the plays production dropping. Uh, you can see a pretty, pretty steep drop when we look at U.S. gas. Most of that uh, is coming from the associated gas that's coming out of the drop in the Permian. Uh, at one time last year, we were predicting that to be about 10 BCF a day. Uh, we think it's not going to be quite that much anymore, um, but still a significant drop. That's setting up um, a, a potential when we go into the heating season this year uh, of some tightness in supply. It's setting up a period here um, where gas prices are going to come up to above 350, uh, which it should be uh, phenomenal news for many of you uh, here on the phone. Um, there is a window then of two and a half to three years that we see um, where gas is going to be up above 350. The big question will be how quickly can people pivot to getting new gas supply online. Um, this will advantage some very interesting places. Um, the Haynesville, for example, one play that's closer here to all of us on the Gulf Coast um, will all of a sudden be in a, a prime position. Um, the mid-continent as well could, could also benefit uh, greatly uh, from sort of the tightness of the gas that's coming around because of the associated gas not being there in the Permian. And the Marcellus, which really is one of the lowest cost gas options, um, the big question will be, can our friends on the East Coast um, mobilize their finances quick enough to take advantage of this window? Um, we are all, as um, I think Jason started out, we're a very flexible um, and agile business these days. Um, we're gonna test that, I think, for the Marcellus operators who uh, some of them um, have gotten their books uh, very much in order and have been dealing with these uh, $2 gas prices and below for uh, you know, more than a year. And so they're, they're used to that end, but will they be able to um, flip the switch on, so to speak, and get some wells up and running to capture this window? So kind of in summary then, um, the. The path is sort of being laid in place. There's a few challenges such as um, getting everybody back to work on the mobility side. Um, there'll be some challenges for the operators um, that are small, um, obviously that um, it, it just went on too long. Um, they just won't be able to um, come back online, uh, unfortunately, so we will lose some some of our uh, family members, shall we say, uh, as we go forward. But the companies that come out of this will be stronger, uh, and particularly if they make the right choices um, around cash management and allocation to shareholders uh, going forward. Because that's, that's, that's really the true thing for our industry right now. It's the battle for shareholders or investors. Um, there's a battle for the basin and who wants to be the dominant player in the basin. Uh, but more importantly, that battle is, is um, subjugated to the battle for investors. And we, we know, Carr, as you have you seen many times uh, at other discussions we've had, we're now less than 3% of the S&P. Uh, it's perhaps our time to come back. Uh, once again, in the investors' minds, and certainly we're setting that up uh, with what I just showed you. So I, I don't know if we have any questions, or Carr, if you have some things you want to. 
Well, just uh, w one or two, uh, one or two thoughts. First of all, on the on the on the gas uh, picture, and I'm so glad you threw that slide in there because I had a question or two about gas. It's just been all crude oil all the time, uh, post Great Recession, really. Um, Natural gas, it seems to me, has just been operating outside of natural gas fundamentals because the supply has been driven by something uh, other than gas markets themselves. It's just been all crude oil uh, related in Texas in particular and in the Permian in particular. And you can see the shift that's taking place just by the improvement in Waha gas pricing relative to the other uh, benchmarks. So that ship is riding as crude oil production is coming down. I just wonder if you see going forward a gas market that looks more like a gas market that's operating within itself rather than being so closely tied to crude oil. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Well, I think there's a couple things that have to happen to get it back sort of um, on its own, if you would. Uh, part of that will be uh, on the global basis, right? We we, we are very much, even though the, um, the U.S. has now converted much of its uh, powers into natural gas uh, and away from coal, um, we still are beholding on a lot of our gas, particularly in the Gulf Coast, to be exported. And that's pretty much been shut down right now um, as far as from an LNG standpoint. We are continuing to increase that. Uh, in New Mexico, we're up over 12 BCF a day, I'm sorry, 10 BCF a day in New Mexico. But the, there's, a, there's a global problem that's, that's really driving us at the moment. Um, when you look at LNG, there's this part of it's, um, we were already before, much like the oil story, uh, we were already in a glut for global gas. Uh, we were already seeing before um, the economic impact of COVID, um, natural gas prices overseas, um, very much distressed from where they were. Uh, we've had natural gas now going into, into Europe and Asia for uh, under $2. And so we've got to get the, the fundamentals, shall we say, of the demand on the international basis back up, uh, I think, to get us a little bit out of this um, great playoff that's been happening here uh, for gas. Uh, we still don't see globally, I mean, the big question I think you're getting at is globally, will the gas finally be delinked from liquid prices on a global basis? Um, there's, there's good news and bad news about that, right? If we have to be careful um, from that standpoint, because on a, right now, that's what's given some areas um, in the past, some relief, shall we say, from uh, from market instability. When we look at the Henry Hub pricing, we see that long term going to still be uh, sub four dollars for quite a while. Versus international, we have places like Australia where gas was eight dollars until recently. Um, and so, if if we were to break that parity, um, it would it would be quite a major shift, if you would, across the board. Um, so it's, but it, it'll take, first we need to correct the demand problem here. Um, and then I think more fundamentals will come in. And you could, you could argue for sure that that's what's happened to the Marcellus. And then look at this slide on the left hand side, that's, that's pure market fundamental, right? That as demand uh, dropped, supply had to do it, had to match it. So. Right. <clears throat> uh, with regard to OPEC and OPEC Plus, we were, uh, I think, it, you know, uh, I, un, without question, the beneficiary uh, from late 2016 through uh, pre-COVID of uh, production uh, restrictions by that group of companies. Um, in response to the downturn and price crash of 2014 through 2016. Um, and those levels had not really come back up again. And now they've cut pretty substantially after they got over this <clears throat> idiotic little spit fight early on in, uh, in uh, COVID-19. Um, and so now I guess the decision on their part is when uh, and to what level to raise production back up again. And that seemed to kind of be based on a notion that uh, improvement was going to be a little less sideways than it is right now. 
Uh, but to what degree are we waiting on OPEC and OPEC plus to figure out what they're going to do in terms of daily barrels supplied to the global marketplace? Yeah, so I mean, we've already seen OPEC signal, right, that they were going to bring 2 million barrels a day of production back on. So if you trying to, I was trying to keep a little positive today, there is some downside risk here. Um, when you think of the scenario of demand is, is, is stalling in, in some parts of the world, uh, the United States and Europe, as I showed mostly for mobility, China's back and in, in, in growing, which is great news. Um, now they're up over 3%. But the, the problem that, that could occur here is the U.S. production, we're at 10, um, we add a million and a half barrels uh, of the shut-ins coming back so we could finish the year um, back up closer to 11. Uh, you've got OPEC, uh, particularly the Saudis, who have been wearing the blunt of the OPEC Plus agreement, um, are, have agreed to put 2 million barrels back up. So all of a sudden you could see 3 million barrels of production uh, back on the schedule here, um, which would sort of force uh, another critical decision from OPEC if, if they, did they do this too quickly, right? Um, and that's going to have the implications for the, in some ways, the fragility, if you would, of that agreement between OPEC plus um, and its members. As you know, some of the members have been very good on compliance uh, and others have not been. Uh, and of course, Russia being the biggest um, sort of partner, if you would, of OPEC um, is, is quite ready to try to increase its production again um, as it's starting to come out of this and, and, and needs uh, some more cash uh, flow for its budget, right? So I think there's some fragility in the OPEC plus uh, agreement that we have to be mindful of here uh, that could continue forward uh, for a while. Uh, depending on how, if if we're all right in the positive aspect here, and uh, 2021 is a good, a better year economically for all um, across the globe, not just here in the U.S., uh, that demand recovery will start to work off that close to a billion barrels that we have in storage. That's not a, not a trivial amount, right? We don't have to get rid of all of it, but. Um, if we've been through this story before in 2014 and 15, and it took us 18 months to work off success, uh, too much excess. Um, gas is doing that now, right? We've had too much Marcellus gas that was all of a sudden piled on by the, by the uh, associated gas. Well, uh, about this recovery, uh, we're about out of time, but one last question, if you can knock it out in about a minute. I just note with interest on your very first slide there in Q3 and Q4 2020 and moving into 2021, that global uh, demand line is well above that global supply line. Um, all things equal, that's music to an economist's ears or eyes, I suppose. If you want higher crude oil prices, what do you think the price implications of that are? Yeah, absolutely, Car. So, I mean, that's that's the, the positive news. So, next year, uh, oil prices continue their rise, uh, notwithstanding you know, some setback, uh, Corona 2 sort of thing, um, or being a little bit ahead of the gun here. And natural gas prices, same thing, on the rise. So, uh, good news, we're off bottom. Um, things are looking positive for those that are in good financial shape um, going forward. Well, Bob, again, I can't thank you enough for your time. Appreciate you sharing some wisdom uh, with us. I'm sorry we didn't get to do this in April at our annual meeting, which you had graciously agreed uh, uh, to come do. And so it was great to see you virtually today. Uh, thanks again for the time and for the insight. Same thing, Carr, and I wish the rest of your virtual conference goes well there. Sign, Jason. It's a pleasure to be part of.